So in this session, uh, we are going to be looking into uh, systems uh, perspective of uh, biomedical concepts. Uh, the systems perspective will take more of an engineering view. Uh, you're all familiar uh, with how uh, physiological signals are uh, sensed non-invasively on the surface of the body. Uh, we have some ideas about uh, the input that's been given uh, to the physiological systems in generating uh, these uh, responses. For example, how action potentials could lead into various physiological signals uh, such as EMG, EEG, ECG and so forth. Now, in order to get insights, information and to know more about these signals, we need to take an engineering perspective, more specifically start to look into these physiological systems uh, from a point of uh, mathematical and signal processing. You are exposed to the ideas of systems and signals, both in the continuous and the discrete domain. Now, in this session, we will be trying to give an intuitive feeling on what some of the concepts you have come across before means uh, with the real world biomedical systems. It is important for us to get these concepts understood. The reason is that then we could use the idea of having the signal converted from analog to digital A to the conversion process through the sampling and quantization that we just discussed. And if it comes as a, a numbers, it, it's seen as a data in the computer. Mathematically, it's seen as a variable. Now, how do we manipulate these variables and numbers dictates uh, what kind of influence and what kind of insights we can gather from the signals. Biomedical signal systems, uh, by nature, they are uh, quite nonlinear. Okay, so they have a nonlinear uh, behavior. They have a nonlinear behavior. And they also possess, on a statistical uh, level, something we call a non stationary. So these two are kind of the underlying properties of the biomedical signals and system. But with the current mathematical background we have, most of the analysis is done assuming the systems are linear and they are also stationary. So it's just an approximation process, but it has worked quite well in the past many years in looking the biomedical systems from the point of linearity and stationarity. So mostly in this course, we will be sticking to the concept of linearity and stationarity, but towards the end of the course, we will see some tools which can deal with non-stationarity and non-linearity so that uh, actual representation of the biomedical systems could be understood. So if you see from a systems point of view, when we talk about linearity, the most common thing uh, that comes to our mind is something uh, called a LTI system. LTI system, uh, which is in the block, and we would be using this kind of a block diagram approach quite consistently in the course, where you assume uh, an input to be X and the output to be Y. It could also happen in the continuous domain, but as I said, the moment we get the signal digitized, uh, we have to see uh, things in the discrete domain. In other words, it becomes X of N and Y of N, uh, which are assumed to be signal, which are sampled as well as quantized. Whereas in the continuous domain, it's good for mathematical understanding and also okay in the theory point, but in practice, what exactly happens is 
uh, what I have put in that block diagram. So Xn and Yn are discrete in time and they could also be quantized uh, in the vertical uh, direction. So the LTI system uh, is kind of the basic uh, uh, mathematical uh, underpinning uh, in understanding uh, the system's perspective and it has served extremely well uh, in getting information out of uh, many physiological signals and you will realize uh, when we start to see some examples and also in your uh, course uh, lab assignments as well as project you will realize how much of the LTA system has played a role uh, in interpreting uh, various physiological signals. So this block diagram uh, is a very simple basic block diagram and uh, for the mathematical convenience uh, we could use the LTA system notation as for example h of k which is also uh, discrete uh, in time. So n and k are discrete variables, uh, discrete time variables and um, discrete time variables so we will see uh, how it relates uh, to each other. Uh, keep in mind uh, in most uh, of the biomedical uh, signals we deal uh, we are dealing uh, uh, at this level. We are dealing at this level. So when you say uh, you are analyzing uh, the ECG signal, the ECG signal uh, is typically seen as Y. It's seen as an output coming from your cardiovascular system and it's been sensed on the surface of the body. Okay, so we normally see the signals that are sensed as Y. And uh, in the particular example I just gave you, the cardiovascular system could be treated as an LTI system. Okay, so you see a, a biological system has been now seen as a mathematical concept in the form of LTI. Then obviously there's an input trigger. Okay, so this is a cause and effect thing. So in pretty much all physiological signals we see, uh, it's seen as an effect and the causal aspects of it, it's not fully understood, but to some extent we know uh, the input trigger or the causal variable could be because of the action potentials getting uh, stimulated. Okay. So yes, we work on why, and as we go along in, in the course, we will see this YN would be acting as an input to systems where we need to manipulate the YN to get another output. So it could be, for example, if the signal YN is noisy ECG, we would be sending this noisy ECG signal YN to another system, typically an LTI system, which will manipulate that input and will produce an output which would be free of noise. Okay. So you got to keep this in mind. So whenever you're designing uh, systems, whenever you're trying to understand, it's a good idea to keep this concept of effect and uh, causality in mind. What causes things and what could be an effect? Again, it's uh, not fully understood in many sectors, a lot of gaps. But nevertheless, it allows you to better a better, better mathematical model, uh, especially in understanding uh, physiological signals. So Yn is what we deal with and Xn is the input and the system, uh, H of K, uh, plays a key role, uh, a key role. Okay. And now what governs uh, the relationship between uh, these uh, three variables? is a very simple easy concept and, and you would have recognized this before. Uh, a fundamental operation of an LTI system, linear and time invariant system, uh, is what's called a convolution. Okay? So this convolution uh, is a, a basic operation of an LTI system and you could realize a, a system and we saw it's linear um, it has certain properties. So if you give an input x1, you get an output y1. Uh, if you give an input x2, the output of the system is y2. So in the form of linearity, x1 will produce to y1, uh, x2 uh, will give y2. Uh, if you want to scale uh, your ax1 should give a y1. If you will scale your signal x2, bx2, it will give by2. On the other hand, when I join the two signals, AX1 plus uh, BX2, uh, the system should give me AY1 uh, plus BY2. So this is uh, a basic definition of a linearity. Okay? So that's what we are assuming. And time invariance uh, is another property. Okay? So uh, 
an outcome of the linearity and time invariance is this uh, linear convolution that I'm pointing. Okay, so output yn, which uh, we showed in the previous block diagram, is nothing but your um, system uh, h of n uh, gets convolved with x of n. So it's all happening in the time domain, keep in mind. So we use a lower case variable for time domain. Okay. Now, if I expand this convolution expression, and uh, uh, again, basically the yn is nothing but um, a repeated uh, multiplication and addition operation. So you see the h gets multiplied uh, for each of the k values and they get added. Okay. So this is a multiply and accumulate operation. In other words, we can call it as math operation. It's important to note down that most of the things we do in signal processing is a multiply and accumulate operation. So we try to multiply variables and we try to add them. Okay. So those two fundamental mathematical operatives are pretty consistent throughout our uh, filtering or if you want to do feature extraction, even if you want to do machine learning, it's all some form of a Mac operations. So that's why the hardware that we design is typically optimized uh, to do this kind of a math operation. Okay. So mathematically, this convolution uh, starts to look like a, a repeated multiplication and addition operation. So here, it seems simple. So what has happened to the input xn is that it just gets either amplified by variable h if it's greater than one, or it gets attenuated if it's less than one, and this magnitude could also be negative for h. So based on how the h variable uh, is structured, I can change my y because I'm multiplying that h variable with x uh, to manipulate my input. Okay, Very, very simple idea. Now, designing that h variable is, is the key here because you don't have any control uh, in the overall framework except that you can control the h because and normally we don't have much control on the input variable x so you can only control h variable and that will give the output y that we need but in natural biomedical system what happens is that the h uh, is controlled uh, by itself uh, in an autonomous way okay so like the pumping of the heart uh, or you know sending of neurotransmitter information they all happen in an autonomous way and the h is determined uh, by the physiological function okay now, what is this H of K? Is that, as the name says, uh, H of K is something called the impulse uh, response of the system. Okay? Impulse response is a kind of a, a, a signature or a, a kind of a DNA of the system. It determines the system's property. So if you want to know what kind of system we are dealing with, all we need to know is the impulse response. Now, why would we call this as impulse response? Why this H of N or H of K is called as impulse response? Okay. Now, if you see in the previous block diagram, we had a X come giving output uh, um, Y, and this was H. So I can easily drop uh, the variable things just to uh, make the concept much more easier. So I could use it just simply as X and uh, so forth. Now, if you see, uh, this configuration uh, has allowed us to define the impulse response. So what happens is an impulse response that instead of having any arbitrary input to the system, uh, I'm going to uh, give the input uh, as a, a impulse function, which is nothing but a direct delta function. Okay, So this delta function, if it's given as an input to the system, and, and the output that I get would be called the impulse response. Okay. It happens in this case, if you go back into your fundamental understanding of signals and system, the property of an impulse as an input, the impulse as an input to H will also give you H as an output okay? and it will become much clearer. So this is how I got the impulse response to the system. So it's a special case of the block diagram which is shown up. If my input X tends to be a, a, an impulse in a very specific case, then the output that I'm getting is nothing but the a response of the system to the impulse input. That's why it's called impulse response, okay? Impulse response. So H is called the impulse response. And as I indicated, impulse response is a, a time domain concept and it's more like a, a signature. It 
characterizes your system. Okay? So many interpretations can be drawn if we understand the H uh, properly. Okay? Now, how would I analyze this uh, uh, impulse response? Okay? Um, the concept is that, uh, just to make it clear, the impulse response uh, uh, idea, uh, which was seen in a time domain, as a, a MAC operation, multiple and accumulate operation, which is nothing but a convolution operation. Okay? So that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, uh, remember, one of the important property is that any function convolved with an impulse function is nothing but the function itself. Okay? So that's why naturally, uh, when I drew this block diagram here, uh, it meant like if I send the impulse, if the system was H, basically the output I'm getting is also H because the convolution of H with a, a direct delta function or delta function uh, is nothing but the H itself. Okay? Uh, the word impulse and direct delta could be interchangeably used. All it means, the property of that one is that at uh, time t is equal to zero or k equal to zero, uh, this function has a uh, value. Okay? That's, uh, that's the property of the direct delta function. Okay? And the area under this impulse is always one. Okay? So it's uh, also called unit impulse function. So the response of your system to, to the spike inputs uh, could also be seen as an impulse response. Now, the convenient uh, tool to analyze the impulse response of a system is uh, uh, the Z-transform. Okay? So rather than uh, just looking into the multiple and accumulate uh, summation expression that I showed before, uh, if you could take um, uh, the whole analysis framework into the transform domain, and we call that a Z transform in the specific case, uh, then you can get even more uh, better understanding and interpretation of what's going on. Uh, as indicated, a Z transform is typically used to deal with the discrete uh, systems. When you have continuous systems, you talk about Laplace transform. And when you're specifically dealing with signals only, then we talk Fourier transform. Okay? So here, the systems have been discrete, so we are going to use a uh, Z transform. And Z transform definition is, is a very classical, simple definition. So in other words, if you have a, a discrete sequence, X and it could be any discrete sequence, it could be X or it could be Y or it could be even H. Uh, when you have a discrete sequence X, it's nothing but, uh, again, a, a multiplication and accumulation operation, but here it's multiplied uh, with this uh, function Z power to the power of negative N, Z to the power of negative N, okay? So that's what we call, uh, uh, as kind of a, a basis function or the building blocks in a Z transform is Z power minus N. And when I multiply a discrete sequence with Z power minus N repeatedly, then I add them, then I get uh, what I call uh, the transform domain variable X of Z. So just to be clear again here, uh, any transform domain variable, uh, we tend to use uppercase. So here it's uppercase X. Uh, specifically to mention that this particular variable has gone through a, a transformation uh, either uh, through Z or it could be Fourier or other things. So in the time domain, we use lowercase x and in the transform domain, we use uppercase x. Now, this Z transform, uh, the summation, though it's given, uh, it should be minus infinity a to plus infinity. So N goes to minus infinity plus infinity. Uh, but in reality, we do not have an infinite sequence and practically it's not possible to have an infinite sequence. So in most cases, uh, we tend to constrain the range of summation uh, to the number of values or variables we have in X of n, so based on the length of X of n. Okay? So if you have, a, 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 for example, what's called a causal sequence, causal sequence, the definition of a causal sequence is that your X of n is zero when n is less than zero. Okay, so if I have uh, n in my x-axis, it basically means uh, uh, if n equal to zero is here, it basically means there is nothing that's present uh, on the left-hand side. So most of my signal, or if not all values of the signal is after n equal to zero. This is an important concept because a causal sequence is something uh, where only when there is an input, there should be an output. In other words, a system should not give an output uh, if there is no input to it. So such a system where the output is given without any input is called a non-causal system. 
And that's something not desirable in, in our analysis framework, simply because they're quite complex to analyze and they don't make uh, much practical sense. So here we call about causal signal. So what happens is that when uh, it's zero, when n equal uh, less than zero, the whole uh, expression that I showed uh, before, the summation starts from n equal to zero to uh, infinity. To be more specific in practice, what happens is that it goes from n equal to zero uh, to a, a, a defined finite values m, which is nothing but, so is m minus one, x of n to z minus n. Okay. So for example, if you have a signal x n, which was sampled at uh, 100 hertz, so if I take one second length of that signal, I will have 100 samples of that signal in one second, so 100 samples. So here in this case, if I want to do Z transform of that, 100 samples, N will go from zero to 100 minus one, which will be zero to 99. Okay, so that's a simple interpretation of this expression. And as I said, pretty much uh, all signals we deal with uh, have finite length. So this summation sign uh, could be tailored to go from zero to m minus one, which also makes sure we are dealing with a causal sequence because we don't go below n equal to zero. Okay. So given an uh, idea about uh, just a simple example, if we do a z-transform, is that let's assume a, a signal here where I have three samples of the signal, okay, three samples coming out of sampling uh, and maybe also quantization here. So xn is my signal with three samples and when I don't give where uh, n equal to zero, it's assumed that the very first sample is, is at n equal to zero. Okay. So if I use that idea, now x of zero uh, would be one, uh, x of one would be two and x of two would be one as well. So if I want to compute the z transform of this, I just plug in these variables in the summation I just showed you before. So the entire sequence now has been converted into x of z and it takes this uh, expression here. Okay. So this has become the z transform of the given a uh, discrete uh, sequence, which could be also a sampled uh, signal here. So it has become one plus two, z minus one plus z minus two. Okay. Now, why we should do all those things? Okay. It, it seems pretty straightforward and also simple. Now keep in mind, okay, so I've taken a, a, a real valued sequence x of n, and when we do the z transform, it gets converted to x of z or x of z. Okay. Now this variable x of z is not real anymore. It is a complex variable. Okay. And that really opens up a lot of door for us to do interesting analysis. Okay. So whatever background you try to build in complex numbers, we'll see a practical realization of why that is important. Okay. So the numbers that you would have seen in your earlier courses or in circuits, for example, has so much implication also in signal processing. Okay, so I've taken the real valued sequence and converted the complex value sequence by just doing a Z transform, another interpretation of that. Okay. Now, Another way to see is uh, that transform, uh, you don't normally hear this, is that uh, I have converted uh, the sequence X of n to also a polynomial. Okay, so this is nothing but a polynomial. Okay. In this case, it happens to be a polynomial of degree two because uh, the highest power of this polynomial uh, could be two, uh, which is the exponent here. So it's a, it's a second order polynomial. So Z transform could also be seen as a tool which takes a discrete sequence or a sample signal and converts it into a polynomial, okay, polynomial. Now, going back into your basic uh, mathematical understanding, if you have a polynomial, uh, you could always get, uh, get the roots of that polynomial by treating it as a function roots, okay. And you will see in a second uh, what exactly that means, okay. Now, the impulse response of the system, we talked about Xn. And when you do specifically the Z transform on Xn, then we get H of, uh, sorry, uh, on H of N, we get H of Z. Okay, when you do a specific, uh, the Z transform of on impulse response, you get H of Z. Previously with the examples we showed, we did it on X, but as I said, you could do Z transform any of the discrete variable, either X, 
at your um, Y. Now, specifically, when you do the Z transform on H of N, which is impulse response, you get H of Z, uh, which is also uh, called uh, the transfer function of the system. Okay? Transfer function of the system. It's just like how uh, H of N, which is impulse response, plays a very important role in characterizing the system. It's just by transforming into Z plane, it becomes transfer function, and it also plays a very significant role. Okay? And normally the transfer function uh, is represented by n of z by d of z in general. n of z is the numerator polynomial and d of z is the denominator polynomial. Now, we will understand slowly why we have a denominator polynomial because so far, in the, even in the example I showed before, uh, with just uh, this simple example, toy example of one, two, one sequence, all we had is, is just the numerator polynomial. The denominator was one, okay, in this case. So, but in general, we could also have a denominator polynomial, okay? So if that's the case, if you have a numerator polynomial and a denominator polynomial, like what's been shown in this expression, and you can see the degree of the numerator polynomial, which is the order of the polynomial is, is M, and the degree of the denominator polynomial, which is the order of uh, the expression here is N, okay? Uppercase M and N. So, so this is a, a, a function with the degrees m and n. m is a degree of the numerator polynomial, n is a uh, degree of the denominator polynomial. And uh, typically uh, what happens is that n tends to be greater than or equal to m. Okay? And then only you will have both numerator and denominator because n is less than m. You will find ways to factorize it and you will just have a numerator polynomial. Okay? So most cases uh, n tends to be greater than or equal to m. Uh, if you wanted to get this both the numerator and polynomial going in your HF set. Okay. Now, this is a polynomial. And as I said, you can make it this polynomial equal to zero. Then uh, we can get functions out of it and roots out of it. So the same expression which I showed could be easily converted into this notation where the numerator polynomial has been factorized into Z minus Z1, Z minus Z2, and so forth up to Z minus Zm. And the denominator polynomial has been factorized into z minus p1, z minus p2, all the way up to z minus pn. Now, why, why this is so important? This is important because eventually, uh, maybe in the next few lectures, you will find out that many physiological sy systems, I can bring it in the form of h of z. And when I bring it in the form of h of z, then when I factorize my numerator denominator polynomial, it will start to give me important features, important indicators of the system. And by using those indicators, it basically becomes my input step uh, towards allowing the machines, machine learning techniques to do an automatic classification. So yes, you would have seen this concept previously in the form of transfer function, but I'm also using this transfer function in a much more uh, different way or a different interpretation uh, and making insights from the signal so that uh, we could develop uh, AI and machine learning systems based upon what I just showed you. And it will become clearer as we go by, but just uh, latch this into your concept for the time being and it will become much more obvious when we take uh, the additional topics on the same transfer function. Okay, now going one step further um, and uh, Typically, the roots uh, of the numerator polynomial gives the zeros of the system, and the denominator gives the poles of the system. Okay, so the pole zero concept is also applicable, uh, as you know, in Z domain, which is the Laplace transform. Uh, definitely, it's coming. This one is coming from the Z domain, so it's the digital domain. Now they play a very important role, and uh, they play in a, a role because we are talking about biomedical systems here they play a role in, in characterizing the system in two ways. Uh, first of all, it allows to know whether the system we are dealing is behaving in a normal way or is it uh, tending to become abnormal, which could be, for example, tracking diseases. And we use a similar idea in the mathematical framework, calling it as stability. Okay. So I'm giving a physical interpretation to the concepts that you have seen before stability and causality, what it means in biomedical systems. 
And also eventually you'll find out, uh, it could also give the frequency response of the system. Okay. So the way we represent the poles and zeros could also be used in uh, giving an idea about the frequency response of the system. Okay. So this is uh, again related uh, specifically from very simple derivations that we have seen so far of the LTI concept. So we started with an LTI system in the time domain and we found out the basic operation of an LTI system is convolution. And when we did the Z transform of the LTI system, we reached something called transfer function of the system. When we reached the transfer function of the system, we could always see the transfer function as a numerator and denominator polynomial corresponding to both zeros and poles of the system. Now stability, how do we define a stability of a system? Uh, again, uh, the idea here is uh, to use an concept called region of convergence, okay? Uh, the region of convergence uh, will allow us to define both stability and causality, but to understand the region of convergence, you need to go into the Z plane. So here I'm pointing a Z plane, and this Z plane is uh, a complex plane. So the Z plane is a complex plane, okay? And it will have definitely the real part, real, value of z here as the x-axis and the imaginary value of z as the y-axis. And this plane is infinite. It has an infinite uh, spread, it has an infinite spread. But what happens in this z plane is that when I make my z equal to e power j omega, okay, which is nothing but cos omega plus j sine omega, when I make my z equal to e power j omega, which is a complex number again, it will have both magnitude and phase. The magnitude of that one, as you could easily see, is z magnitude is equal to one, and the phase would be omega. So when I trace this z equal to e power j omega in the z plane, it becomes a very specific case called a unit circle. And that's exactly the circle has been plotted here. So the unit circle is a specific case of a z variable where z equal to e power j omega, but this unit circle gives you a phenomenal understanding of the concepts of stability, causality, and also the frequency response of the system. Okay, so the three main ideas that anyone has to know in a systems theory could easily be understood by understanding the unit circle. So unit circle has become a special case because the magnitude is one, it's called a unit magnitude, and the phase is omega, phase is plus you trace the phase, it goes from zero, zero, right? This is nothing but uh, pi by uh, pi by two at this point. Here it's pi, here it's three pi by two, and when you come back, it's two pi, okay? So it makes a complete rotation of two pi, the omega. And when you keep continuing on, it basically starts to repeat. So whatever was in zero to two pi, and you make a second rotation, it starts to get the same value, so it kind of, behaves in a periodic way with the periodicity of two pi. So it goes around and around the periodicity of two pi. The values repeat every two pi. So this is a unit circle. Now, what is the importance of the unit circle is that uh, you will find out as we go along. So at when uh, your phase omega is zero, this is uh, what gives zero hertz or DC frequency at this point, okay? When it's pi by two, the phase, then you get sampling frequency by four, omega s by four, okay? Omega is considered to be the sampling frequency, omega s is considered to be sampling frequency, so sampling frequency by four. Here it would be sampling frequency by two. Here it, three times sampling frequency by four or three fourths of the sampling frequency. And when you come back to two pi, it's a sampling frequency. So as we have seen, when we did the graphical representation of the sampling concept, the sample disk spectra was repeating every fs, or in this case, it could be omega s, okay? Both are same. It repeated every sampling frequency that spectrum was repeating, the same thing, okay? If I go around, the same thing will start to repeat, okay? So this unit circle, so along the unit circle, uh, we will understand even more how to get the frequency response, but just keep this in mind for the time being that in the Z plane, Unit circle is a special concept, and in the unit circle, the magnitude is one, and the phase goes from zero to two pi, 
which I can map that phase uh, zero to two pi, this omega uh, zero to two pi would be mapped uh, in terms of the sampling frequency omega s to go from zero uh, to the sampling frequency. This is one on one direct match, okay, direct match. Okay, so this is just uh, putting uh, all those different ideas you had into one simple uh, diagram, uh, which is a powerful diagram by the way. And now let's go one step further on how to use this to define what's called region of convergence and stability and causality of the system. Okay. So region of convergence, as the definition says, is the region where the Z transform converges. Okay. So remember the Z transform expression that uh, we just had before uh, in the time domain, like the Z transform expression like this, for example, one plus two Z minus two. This is a power series. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, region of convergence, it says that it's a region where this power series converges. Okay? And that's an important idea behind defining the stability of the system. Okay? So region of convergence or ROC is something where the Z transform, that is the power series, converges. Only when it converges, we could always do the inverse Z transform okay? and be computed. So you got to remember, in any transformation uh, aspect, when we have a lowercase x, we transform to an uppercase x, it could be x of z here. I should also be able to come back, it should also be reversible. Okay? Because in many applications, when we do things in the transform domain, we want it to come back into the time domain. Okay? And a simple example is that if my x signal is noisy, I go into this domain x of uppercase x, and I do some manipulation in the uppercase x, then that manipulation helps me to remove the noise and I have to come back to the time domain because we wanted signals in time domain for most of the analysis. So it should be a reversible idea and that reversibility could have only happen in a Z transform if the region of convergence is coming to a meaningful uh, value. If it doesn't converge then uh, the inverse Z transform cannot be computed. Okay? So that's why it's important. Now, how could we define the ROC from the point of Z plane or the Z transform is something that should be free of uh, poles. You remember the polynomial description we had, the numerator polynomial, denominator polynomial. So the, what makes uh, importance is the denominator polynomial, the denominator represents poles. And basically the region of convergence definition is that it should be free of poles. Okay. So let's look into this one step further with an example here. So I'm plotting the Z plane and uh, diagram again in the Z plane diagram. Uh, we have the real Z, uh, as I said, on the X axis and the imaginary part on the Y axis. And let's assume that I have uh, two poles. Okay? Uh, and the poles uh, are, are basically given by um, a multiplication symbol here. So these are poles, but there are two poles. And whenever poles are in the Z plane, uh, they tend to appear in conjugate pairs. So if this pole has a value, for example, a plus jb as a complex number, uh, the second pole should have the value a minus jb. So it appears always in complex conjugate pairs. And, and it does have a physical meaning also, we will get to know that sooner. Uh, so here I'm assuming a pair of poles. So basically the pair of poles uh, are here in the z plane. Okay. Now the unit circle, uh, uh, let's call this, the unit circle which we have seen before where the magnitude of z is one uh, that's why it's called unit circle okay so it's quite uh, obvious the two poles we pick are inside the unit circle okay but what you have to remember is that maybe your definition that you have seen before is that if you were asked to define a stable system you would have defined stability before saying that uh, if poles are inside the unit circle the system was stable not necessarily in all cases okay let me say why okay. with these two poles which we have seen we could see there are two region of convergence possible region of convergence is as we defined before is something that's free of poles so if that's the case there are two region of convergence possible one region of convergence with this with a line that's shared it like this this is the region of convergence one uh, which is basically uh, here this small uh, shared it line within the small circle and the region of convergence two is shaded the other way like this okay so that's 
outside the uh, these two poles. So there are two region of convergence possible uh, with the given pair of poles. So one, uh, this one, and the one which is going the other way. Okay. okay, these two are region of convergence. Now both region of convergence have different interpretations. Okay, so for a region of convergence should to be stable system. It should include the unit circle. Okay. Now, if you look into the two uh, region of ROC1 and ROC2, ROC1 uh, is like that. And if you see this ROC1, it does not include uh, the unit circle. Okay. Because the unit circle is somewhere here. And this region of convergence, uh, which is uh, basically this shaded line, and it's inside the unit circle, but it doesn't include the unit circle. So this ROC1 that we just saw, according to the definition uh, is not a stable ROC region. Okay. Whereas if we take the region of convergence two, which is basically uh, the shaded line, these shaded lines here, which are outside this unit circle also, and they're outside this two poles, includes the unit circle. So they include the unit circle, the ROC two includes the unit circle. So this ROC two, uh, could be seen as a uh, one that covers a stability, whereas ROC1 is not a, a stable ROC1. Okay, again, the simple definition of a stability of a system is that the region of convergence should include the unit circle. Okay, and from the example we have seen, ROC1 does not include the unit circle in its region of convergence, so it's not a stable system, whereas the region of convergence 2 includes the unit circle, so it is a stable system. Now, that stability, now in terms of the causality of the system, causality as we saw before, is basically you should have an input to get an output. Okay? And non-causal systems are not good in biomedical because we cannot really interpret uh, what's happening because if there is no input that's triggering, uh, the signal cannot come out magically. Okay? So how do we determine from a mathematical point the system is causal or non-causal? Is this uh, definition, again, it's related to ROC, so if your region of convergence includes the origin, origin is nothing but in this specific point, in the origin, okay, zero, zero. If the region of convergence includes uh, the origin, and if it does not extend to infinity, then the system is non-causal. For the point. So if it includes the origin, if your region of includes the origin and does not extend to infinity, then the system is non-causal. So let's consider ROC1. This ROC1, which we had, uh, definitely includes uh, the origin, okay, and also it's confined, it does not extend to infinity, okay. So it's very obvious the region of convergence uh, 1, ROC1, includes the origin and also it does not extend to infinity. So definitely the ROC1 is also non causal, okay. So previously we all found it was uh, not stable and it's also non causal, okay. So region of convergence 1 is not stable as well as non-causal. Okay. Now in terms of ROC2, region of convergence 2, if you see the region of convergence 2 here, uh, it, it does not include the origin. The region of convergence 2, this uh, particular uh, representation, does not include, uh, the because it's outside these two poles, it does not include the origin and it also extends to infinity. So this is uh, outside these two poles, it extends to infinity which ensures ROC2 is a causal system. Okay. So ROC2 is something that's both stable as well as causal, whereas ROC1 is something that's not stable and non-causal. Okay. So again, to reframe this entire definition of stability and causality, stability and causality is related to the region of convergence, and region of convergence is where the Z-transform converges and the inverse Z-transform is possible. So if your region of convergence includes the unit circle, then the system is stable. If your region of convergence in includes the origin and it does not extend to infinity, then the region of convergence corresponds to a, a non-causal system. Okay. So you can see, you can have various combinations, a system which is stable and causal, a system which is stable and non-causal, a system which is non-stable but causal, but a system which is non-stable and non-causal. So all those four possibilities exist. 
So now your previous understanding of the definition of the stability has been enhanced further by including the causality into mind. And when we did the simple example of the poles, where two poles are inside the unit circle, two regions of convergence were possible, and it came out that this ROC2 is what we need to look into and not the ROC1. Okay, the ROC1 is not good. ROC2, basically we have to look into the region of convergence, which is outside this two ports. It becomes so important as we go along. And uh, uh, as I indicated before, stability uh, relates to uh, basically making sure the system that we are analyzing uh, has meaningful interpretation. Okay? In many cases, uh, a stable system might lead to instability and that could be because of change in the physiological dynamics and instability might lead to understanding that could be some abnormality or saliency happening in the signal. Okay, okay so that's the interpretation of stability in, from a biomedical context. Uh, the interpretation of the causality is that, as we said before, uh, when there is uh, time is less than zero, uh, H of n is equal to zero. Okay, so basically without an input, there is no output. We have to remember that. Okay. Now, we have taken one uh, additional step with the examples. So previously, uh, I just showed the Z-plane example with uh, just a pair of uh, poles. Here, I'm assuming I have two pairs of poles. Okay, pair of poles again appear in complex conjugate pairs. So two pair of poles are given to you, uh, and uh, they both are in a, a different uh, configuration within the Z-plane. You have the x-axis, which is the real value, y-axis is the imaginary value. And in this particular example, this is a unit circle. Uh, you can always put a unit circle uh, just to have a good reference in the z-plane. Now, you see here in the two uh, pairs of poles, uh, one pair is within the unit circle, and the other pair is outside the unit circle. Within the unit circle example, we have already seen before, uh, uh, but we haven't seen an example with outside the unit circle. But nevertheless, the first idea to keep in mind is to uh, is to basically get the region of convergence going. And region of convergence can be easily drawn here if something that is uh, not including the poles is region of convergence. The region of convergence is free of poles. So basically that brings in uh, three region of convergence here. And region of convergence uh, uh, one, uh, which I'm going to draw in green color, is this line here. That's your region of convergence one. Uh, and your region of convergence uh, two, uh, for which I will use a, a, a blue color. So your region of convergence two is uh, outside uh, this first set of poles, but inside uh, the first second set of poles. Okay. So that's your region of convergence two, so which is nothing but here. Uh, and the region of convergence uh, three, I'm going to use uh, the black color again to just enhance what has already been drawn. So the region of convergence three is outside the second uh, pair of poles. So three region of convergence possible in this given uh, example. And uh, this is region of convergence three. And uh, just to complete the thing, region of convergence one at this item. So you have three ROCs uh, that is easily representable uh, through this given example of two pairs of poles uh, and the two, all the three region of convergence does not include the pole. They're just uh, either inside the pole or outside the poles. Okay. Now going back into uh, what we have seen before, let's see how the behavior of the three region of convergence are. So ROC1, you could see it does not include the unit circle. So it's, it's not stable, it's not stable. Region of convergence uh, two, uh, includes a unit circle, which is a red circle, that unit circle, so it is a stable system. And your region of convergence three does not include the unit circle because it's outside uh, these uh, outer poles, so it's a, a not stable or an unstable system, not stable. Okay. Now looking into the causality of the uh, configurations here, uh, in terms of the causality, so if you see uh, the region of convergence one includes uh, the origin and does not extend to infinity, 
which is similar to what we have seen in the previous example also. So it's a non-causal ROC. Region of convergence two, if you take it, which is just the blue line. Uh, yes, it does not include the origin. It does not include the origin. Origin is somewhere here, uh, zero, zero. It does not include the origin, uh, but it doesn't extend to infinity because it's confined by this outer poles. So it, uh, the region of convergence doesn't extend to infinity. So it's a non causal region. Okay. Yes, it satisfies one of the condition uh, for causality, but it doesn't satisfy other condition. Okay. So region of convergence two is non causal but stable. Now ROC3, if you see, uh, it does not include the uh, unit circle. The ROC3 is, uh, does not include uh, origin, sorry. It does not include origin, but it extends to infinity. So it also doesn't satisfy both the conditions. So ROC3 is also a non-causal system. Okay. So this is just a, a, an extended version of the previous example. We saw just with one pair of poles. With two pair of poles, we have seen this. And we have seen uh, these three scenarios. Okay. Now, coming into the practical implementation, especially with uh, the computers uh, and with microcontrollers and microprocessors, uh, the thing we should be concerned is stability. Okay. We could always handle the causality by doing a, a shift. Okay. Yes, causality means that uh, there shouldn't be values for n less than zero. But let's say if there were values for n less than zero, it was non-causal, just like the examples we have seen. But it all happens that uh, with the discrete sequence, I would just be doing a, a time shift towards the right direction and make everything go from uh, zero onwards. So, so that's a, 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 a trick that we could do uh, in avoiding uh, the non-causality problem in a discrete sequence, especially when we are dealing with things and that are offline. Okay, so to make more uh, in-depth understanding uh, the practical ideas, uh, for the time being, let's just worry whether the system is stable or not. Uh, causality, yes, it does give a physical interpretation to that, but in a post-processing situation, it doesn't really imply uh, much. Okay, so the final conclusion is that um, uh, that you got to keep ensuring that uh, for the system to be both stable and causal, um, you should have the poles uh, within the unit circle. And just like how uh, we discussed before, uh, the three uh, region of convergence are also uh, being covered here. Okay. And you can overcome causality by introducing some uh, delay elements. Okay. Now, you might be thinking all things we have seen so far uh, is from the point of uh, poles only, okay. but a transfer function which we have seen before has both zeros uh, and poles. Okay. Now the location of the zeros uh, in the Z plane has no impact on the stability and causality okay. because they don't influence any of your denominator function. Okay. So having zeros is benign, okay. but we also have to be careful in many circumstances we have to design what's called an inverse filter or an inverse system, which is nothing but one over H of Z. So when you have to design a system, inverse system, which I will cover with a simple example in a few seconds, uh, when you design an inverse system, then you can imagine the numerators become a denominator and vice versa. So poles have become zeros and zeros have become poles. Okay. So when your zeros are taking the role of poles in an inverse system, then you have to also make sure the same properties we're expecting with poles also holds true with zeros. Okay. So what would be an inverse system example is uh, this particular case, okay, where, for example, I'm trying to transmit my physiological signal, let's say an ECG signal, let's assume it to be X of N, that I'm trying to transmit through a communication channel, and typically the communication channel is a digital channel these days. So when it goes through a channel, and I could have seen the channel to have this uh, transfer function, which uh, we have seen before, but we are giving a physical meaning in the form of a channel, H of Z. Again, you could use things interchangeably here. I could use the time domain variable H, H of N, or in the uh, transform domain H of Z, they all imply the same. So either you could do it as an impulse response or as a transfer function. 
So this is what uh, the ECG uh, we receive at the receiver, okay? So I'm trying to transmit from my home ECG XFN. This uh, YFN is received from a, a telemedicine unit, uh, maybe in a doctor's office here. Okay? But when we are transmitting, this channel uh, is acting as a corruption uh, entity, okay? So what is happening is that uh, obviously in a bad communication channel, uh, when you're trying to transmit XM, your YN would be corrupted version of XM. And essentially what we call that mathematically is this expression here. And if you look into this expression, we assumed this channel to behave like an LTI system, linear time invariant system. And what it's basically doing to the input XM, the channel is uh, changing your XM by using uh, this, again, multiple and accumulate operation of H, which is nothing but convolution and you're getting output Y. There you go. This is what's happening in communication channels. The signals ECG, which is received at the remote location, has gone through a, a LTI process or a convolution process with the input, and that's what we are getting uh, at the doctor's office. So this is not noise. It is basically causing what's called inter-symbol interference. So instead of XN being received exactly at YN, uh, my YN is not only XN, it's also delayed version of xn so it's not only based on the current value of xn it's also based on previous value of xn and it can go all the way up to uh, m past values okay so this is something like your channel is calling uh, causing what's called intersymbol interference okay now how do i overcome this intersymbol interference okay idea is simple if i have my yn i know my intersymbol interference if i assume i know if hfz all i do is i build a system which is one over hfz and i get back my xn okay so this is what typically could happen at the receiver end okay and in the world of communication they call it equalizer so you, you're getting the idea here so i'm trying to transmit xn but what i'm receiving at the doctor's office in a remote location is yn because of the channel corruption but in the in the receiving end i can always reverse the process or inverse the process if i build an inverse system and the inverse system is uh, acting in a way that it's taking yn as the input and it's giving my xn as an output okay okay so here i'm building the inverse system and that's exactly uh, we pointed out before the pole uh, and zero have flipped here zeros have become poles and vice versa okay so this becomes important that uh, in this concept of inverse system uh, when poles and zeros are flipped, you might want to ensure that to design a perfect uh, biomedical system, rather than just having poles within the unit circle, it's always good to also see the zeros are also within the unit circle. So if you're a systems design engineer, a good systems design, which is nothing but designing your HFZ in the specific case, transformation of the system, or the impulse response of the system, uh, a good one would be where you have both poles and zeros within the unit circle. Okay? Uh, there is a word for this uh, type of a behavior in uh, digital signal processing. And uh, when you have both poles and zeros within the unit circle, they are called minimum phase systems. Okay? Minimum phase system. Okay, so but we would be seeing more of this inverse system concept uh, throughout the course in all our filtering applications in trying to recover signals which are corrupted by other physiological signals. They all try to do inverse uh, operation, okay? This inverse uh, idea is essentially uh, what we are doing in a lot of our physiological signal. When you detect your EEG, EEG signal or ECG, which I just took as an example, when we sense that signal, which is nothing but let's call it a Y for the time being, uh, at the scalp or at the surface of the heart, we can do an inverse operation uh, to get X, in which case I can go up to the level of understanding what's happening with my uh, neuron, what's happening with my neuron potential. Okay. So EEG could be, if you do a proper inverse system, you might be able to understand what's happening at the X. And here the inverse system is that I'm just flipping uh, this transfer function, which was previously H of Z into one over H. So the transfer function, which we saw before, could also play the role of an inverse system and it becomes so important. Okay? So just like how uh, I said, uh, H is nothing but HF in the time domain, impulse response, uh, each one of our EEG signal, Y 
are different. And each one of our EEG signal Y is coming from each one of our transfer function of the system. In the case of EEG, it could be our brain. So in other words, we all have a time varying type of behavior in terms of H. So my H would be different, definitely because of the physiologic difference from your H variable that you're getting. Okay? That's what makes this whole thing very interesting, especially when we start to see the mathematical equivalence of these physiological signals. So if somebody is going through a pathological process, for example, if the EEG is representing something like a seizure activity or epilepsy activity, then you are understanding that system, which we talked before H, is starting to behave in a different way. The poles are starting to behave uh, quite differently. It might be possible when there is a uh, seizure and epilepsy, that particular system H is starting to represent poles, which are starting to go beyond the unit circle and the system is becoming unstable. You see? So I'm starting to give uh, this intuitive feeling of exactly what is happening from the system's point of view, which is nothing but a simple understanding of the transfer function and the impulse response, LTI, they're all interconnected at the end of the day. And, and we are trying to make a reasoning out of it. And you will realize, okay, now if you want to go into practical understanding and especially of the behavior of systems, that the role of H is so, so significant. Okay. Uh, with uh, that being said, uh, I think uh, we will uh, stop this part of the presentation and it will open for any questions. Thank you.